Live from the Moscone Center in San Francisco, this is SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage of VMworld 2010. Now, inside the queue. We're back at the Cube, ending day three here in uh, Moscone Center, live in San Francisco, California, VMworld 2010. I'm here with Dave Vellante. I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE.com. Our continuous coverage, Dave. Wall to wall, blanket coverage. It's been fantastic, hasn't it, John? <laughs> a lot of energy here. <laughs> a lot of energy. You know, we, send, we, it, send it this we, way. We need some energy. We've been going <laughs> nonstop since uh, Monday all day. Uh, but we had some great interviews. We had, I mean, I can't even count. I can't remember the names at this point. Uh, uh, what's your name again? Jim, Jim McNeil. Uh, you had you on Monday, like a zillion guests ago from Falcon Store. 16 days ago. The chief strategy officer uh, back. We're going to do a little uh, review. I mean, I thought it would be good right now to just review kind of what's transpired with uh, the show and some of the themes, Dave. We've talked with cloud service providers. we talked to senior executives at VMware, senior executives from the key partners and uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, ecosystem partners, um, press, analysts. I mean, we've covered it all. Yeah, and, and the big themes here are around infrastructure, right? I mean, obviously that's VMware's home court infrastructure, and then we're starting to see more platform activity. You're starting to see the spring source acquisition really bear some fruit, at least in terms of strategy and platform and now products. And we even had Zimbra on, right? Zimbra, I mean, it was. Zimbra, Zimbra was cool. I learned a lot and demystified yeah, a little bit. I think I see their strategy. I mean, you ready to move from Gmail to Zimbra? Is that <laughs> clear to you now? I think G, I think Zimbra's the Gmail wannabe for the enterprise, and I think they have a good plan from what they say in the numbers. I mean, I need to look into those numbers, but they said 60 million uh, seats. So two million for Google. Now they're talking about paid, right? I think they're talking about enterprise, not yeah, right. total consumer. So that's um, you know enterprise Gmail two million, uh, and there's 60 million seats. So. Uh, and the cap seats. Yeah, the capability sounded uh, pretty impressive. Dave, what were some of your highlights? I mean, for me, I mean, some of the interviews were really uh, very diverse, you know, from Todd Nielsen, the chief operating officer from VMware, I thought was fantastic. Yeah, I was very impressed with Todd. Uh, deal. Uh, Rod uh, Johnson was fantastic from uh, you know, Spring. Yeah, so for, for me, I think the, the VMware momentum is just unbelievable, almost 50% growth. It's the place to be, that's, that's sort of point one. The other is the cloud service providers. I mean, that is a very clear trend. We've had this premise that we've been talking about now for a while at Wikibon and SiliconANGLE, that these cloud service providers are going to be ahead. They're probably going to maintain that lead. Why? Because they're in business, right? They're, they're for a profit, and they're better at doing transactions and operationalizing IT. <laughs> it's funny, you know, the same kind of themes come back, and Jim, we want to get in with you on this because of your, your experience in the industry. We are just talking about the computer industry, how that grew up. The same kind of themes always come up agility, speed, performance, uh, you know, ease of use, you know, value to the, to the user. But now it's a different world, the consumerization aspect. So you know, to me, the key theme that I heard over and over again is speed, 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 everything, everywhere, anytime, seems to be the cloud you know, key end point for messaging. Well, but all the customers looking for simplicity. You know, I mean, speed's great, you know, but if you can't if you can't manage it, if you can't look at how it's going to be accomplished, it, it becomes really difficult. Total related, cost, right? total yeah. cost of ownership is another buzzword. Total cost of ownership and Simpl return, return on investment is still a major issue. And simpler IT is faster. I mean, I think right. that's the one thing that Google has really shown us, right? Jim, what have you seen? So you've been, I mean, you've been obviously been doing a lot of announcements. We covered uh, our just conversation on Monday. You're out on the floor, you're talking to customers, you're talking to all the executives at VMware. We, you just mentioned that <laughs> last night there, having a good time uh, celebrating. But what are you seeing? I mean, you've seen a lot of this movement before in other industries. What's your take of the show? And what are some of the things you've seen? Well, I, I think there's, there's going to be a reality check. Um, we're starting to see the proof that many applications are operating in the cloud. We talked about, you know, mail is obviously the easy one. You had people on the, the cube that are talking about business continuity and disaster recovery. You know, that's a viable business model. People are making money doing that today. Uh, and that, I think that's going to continue because that's one of the things that customers can easily buy into, which is move my critical data into a safe place because they've been doing that for years. It's not the Iron Mountain anymore, it's the Iron Cloud. So that's, that's a viable thing to do. You know, one of the trends we talk about, things repeat themselves over and over again. You know, we go from centralized to decentralized and now we're going back to centralized again and we're distributing to thin clients and everyone's going to move into the cloud and keep a thin client and keep their costs down. So how are we going to get back to distribute it again in 10 years? I don't know, I we'll have to figure that out. Well, these, these, these devices are trying to help us, right? But the iPhones and so forth. But, so let's talk about VDI a little bit. I mean, you heard or now what 
uh, VMworld is calling end user computing, right? They're not even use the, the desktop term so much anymore. You guys, what do you, what do you think about that? Are you sold on that, John and Jim? I'd like your perspectives I'm not, on I'm it. Not so, I mean, I, I'm not fully sold on it. I mean, I like, you know, I see Zimbra up here trying to tout some stuff. I get a little nervous because I just don't think they have that much traction in my mind at this point. And, and I, again, I'm going to do some more analysis on that. But I like the trend of what they're talking about. I and mean, I think clearly virtualization at the desktop is going to be a major, major force. There's no doubt about it. I just don't know enough about, I don't see the proof points in terms of uh, evidence in the marketplace, but clearly the proof points we heard was people are using it Windows 7. Anything that keeps you from doing the job that you want to do on your platform is obviously a nuisance and it's a distraction. So if an individual user has to worry about backing up their system or if they have to worry about moving files in a certain way or launching an application or loading an application, it becomes a hindrance and it becomes an obstacle. And when you have the ability to deploy desktops from the cloud on an on-demand basis that are customized and configured for specific you know, uses and do it at a very cost-effective level, which is less than what an ordinary laptop or desktop would cost, it's a very compelling story. So I think that we definitely heard that from some customers this week, but in pretty narrow use cases, call center or claims desks, things like that. And I get the sense, John and Jim, that VMware is really still struggling to find that tipping point, and I think they've 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 they're betting the house that, on devices. I think devices, that's, right? that's the low hanging fruit, yeah, right? It makes yeah. perfect sense. It's the same desktop across yeah. a thousand seats. Right. It's really easy. But if you look at some of the business propositions from, say, a software developer, you know, we've got over 500 employees. We've got hundreds of developers in China, hundreds of developers in New York. Uh, from a security standpoint, what can I gain? from VDI. I can give a developer a workstation that has all the compute power they could possibly hope for in terms of doing compiles and makes and builds, but there's no USB output. You know, they can't put it on a key, they can't walk away with it. You know, they can't, you know, send, they can't access an email client, they can't send it, you know, just you know, their cousin in, in Shanghai. So there's a lot of value from a, a, a user standpoint or customer standpoint to deploy that, yeah, that I think Dave, I mean, thank Dave. I mean, I, I'll rephrase kind of what I, what I said. I didn't want to come across too pessimistic about VDI or virtualized desktop environment, but I think what I'd say is this. I'm convinced that it's not hype. I mean, we talk about reality yeah, in the cloud, hype, yeah. no, no hype, only proof points. I'm convinced that you know, virtualized desktop is definitely real. It's not hype, there's some proof points. I just don't, understand, I don't yet know what the level of growth will be. So that, that's just, I don't have enough data. And so. I think that my, my, my sense at this event is that VMware is, is, is looking at the consolidation of those devices or at least the data on iPhones and iPads. If I can have a consistent user experience on those devices, that may be the tipping point. And I think that's a lot of potential growth, right? We need that kind of consolidation of data. Jim, what do you think about the growth? I mean, what do you think the adoption and the growth rate will be? I mean, not number, but I mean like massive, slow uptake, steady organic curve. What's the cycle going to be, right? You've got yeah. you know, 10,000 desktops in an enterprise. They have a certain you know, life cycle. They're going to end of life. Where are you going to go? Windows you 7 is happening now, so that's an interesting trigger. Yeah, right? Are you going to move towards you know, another Dell desktop, or are you going to move to another laptop, or are you going to go to a thin client? And, or are you going to say, look it, here's a VDI that I'm going to deliver to whatever platform you as an you know, employee wants to use. Here's a $1,000 credit, go buy whatever you want. I think the acid yeah. test to me will be how Windows 7 rolls out, because Dave, that was a, a consistent theme. Windows 7 was almost mentioned in almost every conversation we had with customers when they talked about VDI. It was, but see, I think, this is where I think VDI has the, uh, or whatever we want to call it, end user computing now, virtual desktop, virtual devices. The real disruption, I think, comes with these devices, because if it's Windows 7 based, then Microsoft is going to maintain you know, its control, it's going to turn the pricing knobs, and I think Microsoft can't control the iPhones, the iPads, all these devices, and I think that's where the real potential is, and I think that's where the growth is going to be. But and how I, does that play into the VDI story when you talk about iPhones and iPads. So I think yeah. that I, I see that, all that data. So I see that VDI story em, e, evolving to one of end users where the user is the 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 center of the universe. That's what I see. I think so I think the Zimbra the Zimbra story I think is a tease for us. I don't think they're unleashing yet. That's why I was trying to get out of them what's the roadmap because I think there's more to Zimbra. You know, I think it might be more of a stalking horse around that kind of ubiquitous edge independent service layer to devices. I mean, yes. So, you know, and, and go back to actually, Maritz came to um, EMC, believe it or not, through a company called Pi, which stands for personal information, right? right? It, was, it was taking all that personal information that we have and somehow consolidating it, making sense of it. We heard from Mosey that they're sort of, you know, still have that IP, but I actually think that maybe 
yeah, maybe that's that what vision I want to go. Come back to that. is coming through in VMware in a much, much grander scale. So is VMware going to deliver the mobile me in the cloud yeah, yeah, exactly. through Zimbra? Yeah, right, maybe that's you know? what the play is here. And that, to me, has much catalog. more now, if potential. They, if your VDI client does the best job of managing your personal data, you know, both private and commercial, Bingo. now that gets then, interesting. Then you've got something right. really compelling. Right. And I yeah. think that's the tipping point that these guys got to get. Otherwise, like I said, Microsoft, I think, controls it and can play you know, pricing games and you know, and Citrix is product. dominant in the VDI space as well, and right. so they're going to continue down that path. Jim, right. Jim and Dave, I mean, I'd like to get your perspective on something because I've been I've been bringing it up in questions uh, all week about the white spaces. You know, where are the white spaces, and trying to get VMware folks and the cloud service right to talk about the white spaces. Where do you think like the areas that really need to be improved? Because you know, let's take the cloud and let's smoke the peace pipe for a minute and say, hey, cloud's great. You know, we we all agree. What are the areas that uh, under the covers that need a lot of work right now? That you know that that are obvious. I mean, obviously security, we don't want to talk, I don't know about security so much, but you know, outside of security, what are the areas? You, you, we talked about backup and edge, storage, and Dave, we talked about networking with Juniper. Well, I, I, I want to make one point, actually, on security. One of the things that I'm getting a sense in talking to the cloud service guys is that security actually has the potential to be better in the cloud, and I'm actually beginning it has to, to, be better in the to cloud. believe that. Right? It's it's a differentiator for it, these guys, and they are. No, it's, it's the not number a differentiator. One, it's, the num it, it, it's minimum. It's, it's a must-have because well, you're not going to move your data in the cloud if it's not encrypted. It's, it's the number one. one so here's number my point one is, reason. When I say differentiator, I mean amongst cloud service providers. Okay, say, well, okay. I got better security it's than an anybody. Anti, right? It's a cost and to they, play. It's, it's, a, it's a table stakes, right? right? And exactly. so they're pouring money into it. So it's going to. So I feel like security. You know, we're going to be able to check that at some well, we point. Well, we heard uh, we heard the cloud service, provider, especially from Verizon. But then Randy Bias, who's in the trenches, was kind of dismissing it. So it's kind of two ends of the spectrums. But they're bundling security and compliance kind of as one like we got it covered package. That, that seemed to be a trend yeah, that so, I saw. So I, I want to talk about uh, data protection because that Jim, it's you know, in part now your expertise. You've, you're chief strategy officer. You're looking out at these trends. That's one area that I think is ripe for change. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, the first thing I have to give John a, you know, kudo, I think what we have to do is write a book for software vendors called In Search of White Space. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because that's what we do. As, as, as independent yeah. software vendors, we're always looking for that place where we can add value and differentiate and be ahead of the VM worlds, the Microsofts, the Citrix. You know, it's like running in front of a steamroller. You know, that's <laughs> our job, right? That's right. what we do. So in the case of data protection, the reason that's always been a very fertile area for independent software vendors is because it's absolutely critical and essential, right? It's a must have. It's like security for cloud is a must have, you know, data yeah. protection universally has got to be there. And just like security has to be in the cloud, data protection is a guarantee. You have to have it. If, if your cloud provider can't tell you that your data is more secure and better protected in the cloud, than it is in your enterprise, end of conversation. And VMware doesn't mind partnering there too because they have bigger fish to fry. I mean, they got a platform they're rolling out. Uh, it's very similar to the Windows, right? It's like Windows is a massive platform for the desktop and they really look yep. to their partners to fill in some key, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of right. similar. It, it, it wasn't until Microsoft said, we no longer do backup in Azure, we're just always up. In, in some ways, that was kind of the first way Microsoft really said, okay, we're in the data protection space in a big way, but it's in their cloud. You right. know, it's not five nines with Azure, it's always everything, yeah. all the time. You right, know? Right. So it's a very different conversation. In the case of the cloud, when you're moving data, you're always going to have data in the private cloud, in the enterprise, and you're going to have data in the public cloud. Hmm. So one of the big questions you have to think about when you're picking a data protection solution is how are you going to get it back out? You know, a lot of these clouds are going to become like Hotel California. You know, you can, you can check in, but you can never leave. Yeah. And, <laughs> and if you want to move from an Amazon cloud to a Google cloud because you're going to save a nickel a gigabyte, which turns into a couple million dollars a year, how are you going to move it? So you're and saying diversity of, of cloud usage. Will mobility, create, mobility, mobility. So I have data in one cloud, data in another cloud, data over here. So basically disparate data. Portability and mobility have to be baked into everything you do in terms of how you're going to manage and organize your data how you're going to move it into the cloud. So you don't want to get in a situation where you get in and you can't get out. How does out. that work? Right. So just take me through that, because I'm not connecting the dots on that. So I get the concept like, okay, I sign up for Gmail or whatever, I'm on these different services. I got data everywhere, my personal data. I might have data that I might be leveraging from another app or whatever, so they're on different clouds. How is all that protected and aggregated or rolled up? I mean. You know what I'm saying? Take me well, through in, that. In, in the, the Gmail, in the Gmail sense, you know, you got to go behind, you know, the curtain and find out exactly how Google's protecting all their data. Because personally, I don't know. Um, you know, do it's I a care? Massive, it's a massive clustered environment. Yeah, you don't care because you're, you're confident that it's happened. In the case of, you know, are you going to move to Zimbra? We talk about data portability. How do you get from Gmail to Zimbra? Well, I'm sure VMworld's going to have to figure that out, or VMware. 
because unless you have a painless and simple way to get all of your data out of Gmail and into a Zimbra environment, you're not going. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to happen. So it's incumbent upon all these cloud providers to be able to move data. So what you can do, obviously, is you can pull all your data out of that Amazon cloud and pay to do that, and then pay to move it up into the next cloud. But that's not going to be brilliant yeah. either. So Jim, we Jim. have to have standards that allow for interoperability and portability between clouds for data. And that's something the industry has to step up to. And the closest to. thing we have to is a REST interface. You yeah. know, you open a bucket, you put the data in, you get it out. You know, it's not that clean. Could you summarize for me where Falcon Store fits into all the post VM world activity? Because all the post VM you world. You know, because well, it all unfolded in front of our eyes. We talked on Monday, but now take another shot. Lay it on top. Point to the key proof points that say, hey you know, the Falcon Store, you know, our, our focus is relevant, and, um, and why people and I, should And I can be self-serving, right? Yeah, be self-serving. Because it's a Falcon Store conversation. I mean, people want to know, Yeah, help you people know, understand. What well, people I, I think, how you're going to deploy those assets. Falcon Store's position on this is that when you're working with IBM, you're working with VMware, you're working with Microsoft, you know, they have an agenda, they have value to bring to the table, and they want to sell you solutions. Obviously, we want to do the same, but our focus is on the protection and the preservation and the integrity of your data. And we're the one vendor who's 100% focused on that. So when you're talking about moving from a virtual environment or from a physical environment to virtual, you know, how are you going to bridge that gap? And how are you going to make sure you can go from one to the other and make sure your data is protected and secured? So everything we do is around that conversation where it's got to be available. If it's not available, it doesn't need no good, right? Yeah. I've got to be able to manage it cost effectively. You know, that's what vCloud Director is about, right? How it's going to be the operating system for the internet. I mean, is it possibly going to be that? And that's it's a really exciting thing, but what does it come down to? Management, management, management. That's where you know, the rubber meets the road. That's what they're focused on. We want to be the management player on the storage and the data protection side. So we got to do the management piece. And you have to be able to protect data based on what you can afford to pay for and what you can afford not to lose, right? So if you can have fault tolerant systems that are always up, that's great. And if you can pay for it, that's great. In a financial transaction environment, you're going to do that. But if you want data that's 10 minutes away or an hour away, you could do that too. Because every time you go down, it becomes less expensive. You have to have a solution that provides that solution. Yeah, right. so you've got, you've got shorter RPO requirements. We've been hearing that a lot this week, RPO right? came up a lot. You know, um, the concept of a backup window, yeah. it's, it's a, you know, it's an endangered species. That's you know, there's no thing as right. a backup window anymore, right? right? And, and, so, and, and you can't move all the data. You know, it used to be a backup window was how much data can you move in a 24 hour period of time? Well, there's so much data you can't do it. So now we have to backup continuously all the time. We have to replicate, snapshot, do it all the time. So that's the way people have to think about their yeah. solutions for us what's going on in the cloud. We think about getting the data in, getting it out, protecting it when it's in the cloud management. That's important to us. And then what's happening at the remote site? Look, you're yeah. moving data in the cloud, but you still have physical data locally. You got to protect that as well. So disk to disk to cloud, that's probably where we're going. Yeah, disk-based backup is another big theme, right? We're seeing that disk to disk is, is, is taking over, right? right? We've seen that now for a number of years. I, but I liked the, the notion that we were talking about before of Apple Time Machine for the data center. I mean, I think that's the model that the industry really has to right, get to. Right, right, and, that, and that's a direction where we're going, and actually we do that, one of our customers says they no longer do backup, they pre-stage potential recovery points. Right. And, and so, when you queue up all those snapshots, you're able to go back in time, just like you know, a time machine does, and say, hey, Mr. Engineer, here's that system from last week, you're up and running and going. So that and when you deliver that as a virtual machine, it's instantaneous. And, and that recovery model is the sea change that I see. Right. And Everybody it's being done right Change now. is the key. I heard it's, change, it's change, right change. Now. Disruption I heard consistently. The word change, change. They're changing the way it's been done. It's broken. Um, it's got to be fixed. That was another well, big thing. You know what else is broken? If we, if we start talking about disk to disk to cloud, which is you know, a wonderful nirvana from a user standpoint because you don't have to worry about tape libraries and it's gone off to this happy, safe place. You know, it's like retirement home for your data. Yeah. And it's gonna, you know it's being cared for and it's going to come back, right? Yeah. But the, the thing is that people don't really think about this. When you move data into an environment and it's sitting on a disk and it's idle, there's this horrible, nasty thing called bit rot. You know, what about data preservation? What about data that has to be around for 100 years? You know, what about, you know, 
application obsolescence. So we uh, we don't talk about that, you know, because tape is around. I got bit rot all in my house because I got disk drives that can't even be plugged into. Yeah, right. You can't plug yeah, them in like, anymore. Yeah, right? I, I thought this, I had right? all my family it's photos on that disk drive. It's not booting up. Well, by the fun. way, I, I you know I've got all of my letters on three and a half inch floppies. I'm going to read yeah. those, right? Yeah. I had to go to Fry's and but, buy But we one. won't throw them out. But those are the realities <laughs> of, of data, and and many companies that have really valuable archive data. Like I said the other day, we we're talking about the Wizard of Oz. I mean, this is a this is a global treasure, right? You don't want to lose that stuff. It costs money to store it. SEMPTI, you know, Society for Motion Pictures, Television Arts, they say that it costs half, it was a half a million dollars a year per gigabyte. I mean, come on, to store this stuff? You can't do that. So we have to get to data preservation as part of our conversation, and we have to get to data shredding, because anybody who's ever had a really yeah. lengthy discovery process in a legal case, would say, I really wish I had destroyed that information. Yeah. How do when you I had defensively delete data? And this comes to data classification. Yeah, so exactly. Talk about white space. I mean, this is a space. real so challenge. How do we organize, categorize, and manage all this data in a cost effective way? And that's a service way. offering. You see that as a service? Well, for obviously, us, yeah. for us obviously, we see it as, as a solution, an application we're going to deliver to our customers, and the cloud providers are going to provide it as a service. And, well, and it's got to be automated. I mean, this is something we've talked about a lot in the Wikibon community. Is is automating data classification at the point of creation or use? Because uh, if you can't automate that classification, you'll never scale. And, and humans can't automate it. We can't tag it. Right? Humans are terrible. At, well, at, you know, at, we, we got to get better at that. Things. We got to. We yeah. have to create metadata. You know, we've got to tag. It. I heard software tag. too. Key to it's, success is software. The hardware is going to be essentially. That was a big message. Obviously, virtualized machines over physical. I heard software was a big. Yep. Well, you got to think about how frustrating virtualization is to hardware companies because what's it about? It's Intel's about gotta abstraction. Be. It's about democratization. Well, that's why Intel is going to put security in the chip. Intel right? stocks right. got to be plummeting but, but, on but this. I, but I think you're right. You're onto it. It's metadata. Right. That is the key. Metadata you, is the answer. Be, it's yeah. in, in metadata can, repositories. And you know what that creates? More data. More data. More truckloads of data. data. The meta metadata. There's two <laughs> metadata. There's multiple so, so, levels so of metadata. So now metadata. you're going to have your personal device, and what it's going to actually show you is your metadata. Yeah, right. It's going to give you well, an index of all your so photos. So here's a philosophical you, question for you. So, so the future, is there reasoning involved? I mean, we talk about learning machines, and you know, is there meta reasoning involved? I mean, actually you got to be, you know, about bit rot, I mean, that implies stale, but you got to be learning. I mean, the machines, can, can these machines really be, you know, you know you know, we got, into, we got into this great philosophical conversation the other day about defining data. You know, we started about talking about defining data protection. And someone said, well, what the hell about data protection? What about defining data? You know, who defines data? And the answer is, well, the creator right. of the data defines the data. Who owns the and data? So whether, whether the data is the application or the data is, you know, a physical file or a picture or a photo, the creator, the application, or the individual user is the one who's created that data. They are the creator, and they define what it is and how it's going to be cared for. And we have to really start at that conversation. Dave, Dave, that I, I, Dave, I wrote a post a year and a half ago called "Data is the New Development Kit," and uh, it was part of our research in the labs when we were looking at Twitter and Facebook. And and what I what my thesis was was that da available data that can be leveraged in a software way is the new development environment. And we heard that from the Dallas Cowboys to um, you know, the Spring guy, you know, the CEO of Spring, that the data is going to drive new applications, the feedback of data. So access to data, whether it's you know, gestural data or data from applications, and that that's what people are going to be developing on, is that data is more central to you know, refining intelligence, to yeah, really? And if you can't find it, and you can't access it, and you can't organize it, then it's not even. I mean, the be Dallas Cowboys are going to run basically, um, you know, the notion of having data available so that based upon whether they win or lose, the prices of materials, shirts in the gift shop will change. Or if they have a family event, maybe it's not as high as a Super Bowl, so they can adjust on the fly spot prices based upon the venues. So John, that's uh, real time. So John, we're out of time, but I think this is something that we should take up within our communities, our respective communities, and really you know, start to set forth the model, the data model, the data protection model, how the cloud and virtualization changes that, and really try to get our, our communities behind what that model looks like and, and lay that out and, and put some precise definitions around it. If we define that in the wiki, you know, we'll build it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's, that's what we need to do. And, and, yeah. and, and let's get the input of the users, of the technologists, of right. the analysts, the consultants, and, 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 and let's see if we can put that down. I know we can and do hopefully it. hopefully let's force rank and, it by priority so I can actually get something done before you know, 2020. Right, and, and, <laughs> right, and let's challenge the vendor community no to, hype proof points. to deliver. Right, yeah. exactly. No hype, exactly. just proof points. Great, Jim McNeil, right. it's great having you Thank on you again. Thank you very much. Great to Thank see you. Thank you. Hey, we're going to wrap up day three. 
Whoa. Day three of the Q. Fly Q-ho. by. Three. Day three. <laughs> day three on today is Friday. I mean, what day is today? Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay. Day, Wednesday uh, at the Cube. Silicon Angle's continuous coverage here at VMworld Live 2010. The Cube, a place where we acquire knowledge. It's growing. We have zillions of pieces of content. Dave Vellante, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Great day. Shout out to Michael Sean Wright, Nice Fish Films, pro- directing. My, Mark Hopp, who's producer. Shout out to Ricky with the photos and keeping us on schedule. Nick, Kristen Nicole doing the news. Kyle Owen with the photos. My nephew, Joe Sinar. Thanks a lot. Joe. Guys, great job today. It's a wrap. See you guys tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock for a CIO customer roundtable. And then we're going to wrap up with a bunch of community podcasts, a lot of social media tomorrow. So come back Thursday for the final day of VMware 2010.